Hello, everybody. My name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of JFN, I would like to welcome you to today's important webinar and virtual meetup on the topic of the impact of COVID-19 on day schools. This is a second of a series, and we hope to have another one in June, so look out for your emails about that one to really dive into different subjects and different, um, different issues that are going on in day schools. Because as we all know, schools moved to a virtual platform nearly two months ago, and so much has evolved within that time. And today we are joined by a panel of funders and program providers to learn about success stories from the field and the opportunities being explored to support our, our schools and improve student experiences. And so we have lots to cover, lots to talk about, and we hope to have a wonderful interactive conversation. And so with that, I wanna turn it over to a wonderful partner, um, Paul Bernstein, who is the CEO of Prisma, Center for Jewish Day Schools. Paul and, and um, his colleague, Hannah, have been so helpful in putting all of this together. So I'd like to turn it over to Paul to frame the conversation more and, and start us off today. Thank you, Paul. Tamar, thank you. And thank you to the Jewish Funders Network for arranging this and partnering with us on it. And, and welcome to everyone else. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to see many familiar faces and, and some new, really delighted that we have an opportunity to engage in quite an in-depth conversation about some of the things that are going on in Jewish day schools and some of the partners that we're able to work with. And we've got a fabulous set of speakers um, who are really going to share different aspects of work that's going on now uh, in our conversation. Our goal is to be very informal. Um, I'm glad that we have a group that probably allows us to have more of a conversation um, than a one-way webinar. So as you're listening to anything that any of us are discussing, feel free to put comments in the chat, feel free to start thinking about either put your question straight into chat or if you prefer to ask them out loud when we get to question and answers uh, later on in the hour, then um, uh, I would encourage you to, to chat, I would encourage you to think of your questions so that we can really have a good discussion. What I want to do just very briefly before introducing the speakers is um, to give a little bit of an update on what is happening um, around the schools and in doing so invite those of you who are close either to individual schools or who are working with groups of schools to, uh, to later on to share your reflections as well just to add to our conversation. Um, uh, just some comments both general and specific to the crisis that we are now in. Um, what we're trying to, to look at today really are the absolutely essential different aspects of what it takes to educate a child or to raise a child in a school environment. That is the academics, the social emotional needs, and also the spiritual needs of a child, which together really do form the essence of a lot of what we do in Jewish day schools and all are critically important. I was thinking as I was reflecting as I was thinking um, ahead to this webinar on some of my own experiences and remembering back to uh, the open house that my wife and I went to um, with our elder child at the time when we were looking for enrollment at uh, elementary school level. So this is a long time ago. That student is now at college. So just to date it a little bit. Um, and as we went around the school, remembering, you know, listening out for the academics, which were good, good like other schools around, and listening out in particular, of course, for, to the religious aspects and what we were, felt they were going to get from a Judaic point of view that was also strong. The thing that really got us overall was the tour that we did with the fifth grade students who were taking us around the school. And at the end of it, we were thinking, if our kid turns out like those kids, we'll be happy. And that's, of course, a statement about the whole child, not just are they getting a, are they getting a grades, it's about the whole child that's being produced in Jewish terms, in social emotional terms, in terms of their confidence, in terms of their ability to relate to us as adults, in terms of um, obviously what they are learning as well. And that's why we want to bring these themes together, why it's important to us all the time, and why it remains critical to us in a time of crisis and a time of schools being virtual as we have now. Most of you, I think, are familiar with what's happened in the last couple of months from a school's point of view. 
it's a remarkable thing and a huge credit to uh, all of our schools right across North America that they didn't just close. In fact, they'd never closed except perhaps for 48 hours. They moved to continue in the virtual environment and have done so and have worked extraordinarily hard to support their students and support the families um, and have worked extraordinarily hard to continually improve what it is they're delivering academically, what they're delivering religiously and what they are delivering in terms of the really critical support for social, emotional and mental health um, uh, needs of their community. And I think we all know from what we've read and heard quite how important these issues are and how right now we are doing two things. One is the schools are continuing to deliver through the end of the school year. In the, in the South, the school year actually in some places started to end last week, if you can imagine, summer is upon us already. In other places, of course, in the North particularly, we continue for another month. That's a really important continuing process. And then another piece which is becoming very important and is where we as Prisma are really putting a lot of energy to bring the schools together and to help them think together to find solutions is what does next school year look like? That starts with some simple questions about what does it mean as we contemplate, please God, the opportunity to go back into physical schooling? Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Maybe we'll be in and we have to come out again. We'll be dealing with all sorts of different needs among students and families and faculty as we come back into that environment in the next school year. It's a highly complex, multifaceted piece of planning that schools are engaged in and we are very committed to helping them. We're also very committed to helping them working with partners. And that's why we have four tremendous people with us today to talk about different aspects of the work with schools. I want to give a brief introduction and then I'm going to hand over to our speakers. First, we're going to hear from Rachel Mole Abrahams, who is a senior advisor for education grants and programs at the Mayberg Foundation. And Rachel is going to talk about um, some really exciting new developments that are coming through in, a, in among a number of organizations working together um, in the academic space. Uh, after that, we're going to hear from Natalie Jonas, who is a passionate early education, early childhood educator. And she and her husband have both founded and funded the foundation's pilot program at the Yavna Academy in, in Paramus, New Jersey. And Natalie's going to talk about what that program involves. We're then going to hear from Debbie Niederberg, who's the executive director of Hidden Sparks and also directs the George Raw Foundation. And through her work in both places has developed some tremendous initiatives that are really important to, uh, to the social and emotional and other health uh, of students and working with schools. And then our fourth speaker is Rabbi Sam Feinsmith, who directs the education, Educating for a Jewish Spiritual Life Prayer, prayer, prayer Project, excuse me, um, and the Clergy Leadership Programs at the Institute for Jewish Spiritual, Spirituality. And Rabbi Feinsmith uh, will speak to us forth. And then after that, we will open up for questions. Thank you again to all of our speakers. Thank you all for being part of this conversation. And on that note, let me introduce Rachel Moll Abrahams. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as part of my role at the Mayberg Foundation, I work closely with JEIC, the Jewish Education Innovation Challenge. The foundation initiated and incubates JEIC which works to catalyze radical improvement in Jewish day schools across North America. I'm pleased that my colleague, Sharon Frendel, the managing director of JAIC, is joining us here today. At JAIC, we believe that Jewish day schools need to be environments with a culture where students can internalize the beautiful wisdom, values, and sensitivities of Judaism. And we also believe that there are educational practices that promote better student outcomes. And by that, I don't mean better test scores, but rather fostering the desire to be a lifelong learner and continually engaged in Jewish practice. And so JIC has always looked for ways to promote those types of practices, 
methodologies that include more collaborative work, more individualized learning, more student choice. When schools had to shift to remote learning, all of a sudden teachers had to adapt and they also all needed professional development. Many teachers began to realize that methods that may have worked in a face-to-face -face classroom were not necessarily working well on Zoom. So many began to look for ways to better engage students and even ways to get students off of Zoom to independent work, to replace synchronous learning where everyone does the same assignment at the same time with asynchronous learning, where students have a choice to decide when to complete their assignment while still meeting teacher deadlines. And that's where our program comes in. It appears that schools will need to continue to think about some type of remote learning for the coming school year. And so teachers will continue to need to sharpen their skills skills that will also translate back into face-to-face -face classrooms when the time comes. They need to consider ways to combat Zoom fatigue. And so we are about to launch, everyone should be hearing about it hopefully within the next week or so, a summer professional development program for all day school teachers in grades one through 12. Working with Prisma, which will handle marketing and registration for the sessions, the program will run from June through August and will offer an array of courses designed to meet different needs. Some will be standalone sessions and some will be in a series. Some will be one hour long and some will be two. Some will be during the day and some will be in the evening to accommodate teacher schedules during the summer. All the sessions will introduce teachers to more tools and methodologies for increasing student engagement. Some will focus on a shift to independent, guided, asynchronous learning. Sessions will be taught by two well-respected professional development teams. One group of classes meant for general and Judaic studies educators will be delivered by Better Lesson, a company that coaches teachers via video conferencing, even in regular times. They have been working with day schools over the last five years to help teachers shift their practice to better use technology to impact student learning. The other strand of sessions will be given by United, an arm of the Diaspora Initiative of the State of Israel. With this project, JAIC hopes to meet a current need in the field while supporting work that meets its continued long-term goals and its continued vision for schools. It is collaborating with proven partners in the field, working through Prisma, and starting something at scale. We are trying to take a challenge and turn it into an opportunity. I'm happy to connect with anyone after the session who would like more information about the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, now let me hand over to Natalie Jonas. Natalie. Hey everybody, um, thank you for having me here. It was really cool to hear about everything you're doing, Rachel. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about um, the social emotional learning program that we, my husband and I started this year and give you a little bit of information about what, how we thought of it and what it looks like and what, it, what results we're getting. So my name is Natalie Jonas and I've known that I wanted to be a teacher since I was five years old. As soon as I got to college, I knew that early childhood education was the route for me, and I loved every class that I went to. I learned every day at school that it was the most important job of any teacher to create a sense of safety and security and belonging in each classroom. That it was important to focus on the whole child so that every student would feel that they are a valued and cared for member of their classroom community. With that foundation of care we were taught, every student could thrive and engage meaningfully with their learning. During my years in the classroom, I found this to be completely true. Where there was kindness and respect between teachers and students, where relationships were central to the classroom experience, classrooms flourished. 
Today, in my position as a funder, I'm striving to create an infrastructure that would support this type of learning school-wide and really become the culture. This past September, after months of planning, my husband and I launched our foundation's pilot program at our children's school, Yavna Academy in Paramus, New Jersey. We curated the program, choosing aspects of three different social emotional curricula, Responsive Classroom, Yale's Ruler Program, and Generation Mindful. We outfitted each of our four pilot classrooms with designated foundations comm spaces and added a third specialized teacher to support with program implementation. We had one class per grade in pre-K through second grade. Our kids were starting each morning with meaningful morning meetings that built community and a culture of sharing. We had mindful minutes and intention settings, intention setting to guide transitions and new work. Children were given rich emotional vocabularies and were taught the skills with which to express themselves productively. Once the vocabulary was in place, there were book readings, lessons, and discussions that covered social emotional concepts. Children in pre-K were learning how to resolve conflict by speaking past the general, he or she was mean to me. Their teachers were supporting them and identifying what felt mean and how they could advocate for appropriate interaction between peers. Kids in kindergarten were weekly creating books that delved into different emotions. They noticed that different situations could trigger different responses in different children, and that was another conversation. First graders were tackling a different media or character trait a week. Second graders were learning that just as straws are flexible and can bend in different directions, they too can be flexible and malleable with their thoughts. All classes were engaging in gratitude practices. This is what was happening in the first six months of school, pre-COVID. We were teaching Menschlichkeit as a concrete part of the curriculum, and the children were absorbing it like sponges. We were sending newsletters home to the parents to share our progress and encourage shared language between the home and school. Parents shared heartwarming stories of how their children were applying their new knowledge and skills at home. One mother reached out with a particularly powerful story. She shared that over one weekend, her grandfather had passed away and her sister had had a baby. She shared that when she told her seven-year-old daughter, it was obviously a lot to process and a mix of emotions. She was awestruck, she said, as she watched and listened to her young daughter use all the words and skills she learned at school to move through all the different feelings she was having and arrive at calm. I cried when she told me that story. These were the types of communications we were receiving before the pandemic. Currently, the most requested information we're getting, uh, information request is from the children themselves. Their parents are reaching out asking us how to create their own calm spaces at home. Some of the kids have, doc have parents that are doctors working on the front lines and are asking for a place to process all the scary information they're hearing. One kindergartner <laughs> told her mom she needs a calm space for when she just needs a minute. Being home with everyone is definitely getting us to different spaces in our minds. So this work was meaningful and creating impact before everyone's life turned upside down this March. And its importance becomes ever more evident as we look ahead to the future and prepare for a holistic and sensitive return to learning in the fall. To that end, and gleaning from our success this year, we are currently planning for an earlier than expected expansion of the program. Please God, this summer, we will be training all Yavna staff from pre-K through third grade for full immer immersion into the foundation's program across all classes for fall 2020. When kids come back to school in the fall, whether on site or on Zoom, we need to be prepared for questions, for big emotions, and to support their return to socialization after an, un, after an extended period of social distancing. Any way that we get involved now, today, in preparation for this unprecedented school year is an investment in our, child's mental, in our children's mental health and our joint futures. I would urge any of you who are in a position to support your schools in implementing social emotional learning to do so now. The time is ripe and the need is real. I have seen firsthand how one person can share an idea that can create meaningful and impactful change. I'm happy to connect with anyone to discuss different forms of 
involvement um, and share more details about what we did. Um, and I would just say that there's many ways to get involved from big to little. And I think that any support that we show the schools today is going to be really important going forward. Thank you. Natalie, thank you so much for that and, and Carla Kavod for what you, what you have done in the school as well. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Debbie Niederberg uh, from Hidden Spark. Debbie. So Natalie, thank you. That sounded, uh, that sounded so important and um, the work that uh, you mentioned, Rachel, also just uh, sounds terrific. So I, I guess I come here wearing, uh, wearing two hats. Um, as uh, Paul explained, I both direct the George War Foundation with a um, emphasis on workforce development and um, some educational initiatives and co-founded Hidden Sparks 13 years ago. And that was before Jewish day schools were talking about uh, diverse learners. Um, and we all know, many of us can remember back or think back what it's like to be a child who was struggling, who doesn't fit in. School can be very demoralizing for those kind of children. Um, what we saw when we, uh, when we collaborated um, with principals 13 years ago was that day schools didn't have the language for struggling learners. And at the time, we partnered with leading national educational thinkers to bring that understanding about learning and behavior and the skills to work with these struggling students to teachers in Jewish day schools through best practice models like coaching and school embedded teacher training to have people working, coaches working with the teachers every week in their classrooms. Um, now, while we have always thought that this was important, we're seeing that now it's equally, if not more important for two reasons. Um, academically, what we're seeing, and we work with uh, 108 schools, what we're seeing is that students who are struggling are falling even further behind. Um, that could mean, uh, it, that could be for a variety of different reasons. There's um, a lot going on in the home, increased conflict with parents, avoidance, not logging in, Zoom fatigue, as well as just the platform has shifted. The Zoom platform is inherently a more frontal platform you know, when just technically when, when the teachers do a screen share, they can't see what their students are doing, their little postage stamps. So um, it's, it's really hard to teach in a differentiated way. And, um, and the question becomes, what is meaningful, impactful learning? The second aspect that we're saying is so critical is for the social emotional reasons that Natalie, um, you talked about. We keep hearing from schools, from principals that we work with, and from everyone on our um, sessions that we've been running for parents and teachers, that schools are really concerned about the kids who were vulnerable before COVID. School was their safe space. Home is not their safe space necessarily, or their home is not a particularly healthy environment. And of course, now with the new stresses, parents are tired or burnt out. So the, the, the students need a lot of monitoring on Zoom and our coaches who shifted over, uh, many of them have shifted over to, um, from a, uh, to an online, they're working in the classrooms, coaching teachers, they're keeping an eye on the students, an extra set of eyes, which becomes even more important, and helping teachers identify, how do you identify anxiety through a screen? So those are the kinds of things that they're addressing. Secondly, Kids all have just this whole platform. Kids have become more isolated. They miss their friends terribly. And this is also a focus for, for teachers. Schools are working hard in this regard to maintain those connections. I have a sister-in-law, for example, who is an early childhood educator, and they're doing at a local Jewish day school, um, at, actually at SAR, they are, they're having small classrooms, uh, um, creating breakout rooms just to have play dates so that kids can continue to socialize. And just a quick shout out to all the educators. We're hearing all the amazing stories of how they're, it's so important to keep those connections, the kinds of things that they're doing, the drive by and like Omer, handing out packages at the edge of a, of a, you know, a broom handle to kids and the creative uh, pre-Shabbat Ruach or Habdallah or uh, Yom Asmaut. So um, schools are really, I think educators have really lifted us, uh, obviously, in addition to all the frontline workers, but uh, medical workers, ed educators have really been carrying the load here. Um, and so quick shout out to them. Rahm Emanuel uh, once said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. 
And I think, I think we're learning a lot. Schools and all of us are learning a tremendous amount from this experience. There's a lot of opportunities and takeaways. Um, just the idea that um, the social emotional is such an important um, is such an important aspect of our work in the classroom. I think what um, at Hidden Sparks, our coaches always work, have worked on this, how to create nurturing and safe uh, and embracing classrooms for diverse learners. But I think what, what's happening here is that, um, that teachers are now seeing that this is so fundamental and they're asking, what can I do as a teacher to make my classroom uh, more social, social emotionally um, accepting to reach out to my students. And I think that we um, are also recognizing that all teachers need this training and being more explicit about it. Um, and, um, uh, you know, going forward, I just want to share a little bit of our thinking in terms of opportunities. We're going to be focusing on three areas. And Rachel, I think it's great that we connect afterwards. We are, um, we partnered with CIJE, the Center of Initiatives in Jewish Education. And we have a team of school leaders from the New York area who are co-chairing with us an effort to um, prepare um, their teachers um, for, uh, for the upcoming year, both what are best practices in education, as well as how do I make my classrooms uh, social and emotionally welcoming to all students. So um, just in terms of the, um, and Hannah will, will show a, a short clip in, in just a minute. Um, I have another brother who worked as a teacher at a local high school. And the word there, the buzzword that he always tells me is engagement. Engagement, engagement, engagement at Zoom is, is so hard to engage on. And, and, and I would say yes and. Engagement is an entry point, but the, the question that's being asked and it's forcing all of us as educators to think about is um, how do we delve deeply into learning? How do kids, the kids on the other side of the screen and all kids, how is learn how is learning going to be maximally impactful and so we see this as, a, as an opportunity to help teachers really unpack what is impactful learning um uh both in uh when we're back hopefully in our brick and mortar schools as well as if we have to and most probably have to shift at some point to online um and uh and finally, I would, um, well, Hannah, do you want to show the quick, we, we ran a group of sessions for parents and teachers we figured on, that connects to um, uh, anxiety and, and promoting the social and emotional well-being of, of, of students. So if you want to show. Maybe. <laughs> always disclose how can she help them whether in the moment or at some other time it is something that by the way I'm hearing from teachers from guidance counselors are really struggling with I'm doing therapy sessions with patients some of whom are adults who are doing them in their car sitting in their driveway in their car because they can't talk privately in their home and those are adults um, the only um, strategies I have or suggestions I have is to arrange with the parent to have a phone call with a student from time to time. It's a way of touching base and the student may be able to take the phone to a quiet place and to ask the parent in advance and say, I'd like to discuss some of your child's learning with your child or go over some strategies. Is there a time when I could reach him or her that they could have some privacy and talk quietly on the phone? Okay, so I would just say right before this, I would urge you to listen, right before this, this part on the clip was actually um, Dr. Mona Novick, who's one of our co-educational directors and, um, and uh, the Dean of Israeli was talking about, so th that was part of the clip we, we wanted to show was, um, but we ran out of time, was um, how can you introduce um, different emotional feelings uh, and how to assess feelings in your classroom? So uh, maybe we'll share that out after this call. Um, but we, um, the, the third area, and this was part of a series that we ran for immediately after um, COVID struck for parents and teachers. Um, and the, the last point I would make is setting up parents for success. When, when I, um, 
when this began, I got on the phone with school principals to, to talk about, to hear from them what was happening in their schools. And the response I got was, um, was that teachers were okay, they were managing, they were amazing, they were making it through. Students were, you know, were making uh, do more or less, but we're really concerned about the parents. The parents are really, um, they were really, the parents are really anxious. Suddenly they had to become the experts in education. They were managing the uncertainty in their professional lives. Perhaps they didn't have adequate um, laptops for all their kids and, and all the stresses um, they were dealing with a any underlying stress that was part of a family and it was exacerbated by being under quarantine. So um, we, we realized that parents re really needed support. And if you have, if you look at the metaphor, like an emergency room, when you do triage, immediately in March, we ran these Q&A sessions that didn't even have an agenda. They were just support sessions for parents. Um, to validate what they were going through, to hear what they were going through, to, to provide that emotional cushion for them. So that was just the triage stage, the first stage. Then after Pesach, when we felt that everyone was getting into a new normal, then we began to run sessions on promoting the emotional well-being of your students, what you can do, how you can help your children socialize, etc. So these are the three areas that we're really focusing on, fo focusing in on a summer um, a summer session that will incorporate best practices around education for both in school and remote, um, and which will include the social emotional component. What can I do as a teacher to, uh, to help my students feel belonging and connected, as well as we're looking at doing some more programs for parents. Thanks. Debbie, thank you very much. So I'm now gonna turn to Rabbi Sam Feinsmith, and then after that, we will open up for questions for, and discussion from everyone. Sam, over to you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I really just want to first begin by uh, extending my warm wishes to everyone. I hope you're all feeling safe and healthy during this time. And also, uh, I want to thank my colleagues for the amazing work that they're doing in supporting schools during this time. Um, my name is Rabbi Sam Feinsmith, and I'm the director of the Educating for a Jewish Spiritual Life program at the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, which is a global leader in teaching Jewish spiritual practices grounded in mindfulness and Jewish wisdom. Um, <laughs> the Educating for a Jewish Spiritual Life program is a professional development program for educators uh, in Jewish day schools, as well as congregational schools, but today we'll focus on day schools. Um, that um, <clears throat> teaches concrete ways to practice, model, and teach Jewishly grounded mindfulness skills that promote social and emotional competency and spirituality as foundations for lifelong thriving. Uh, the program teaches three specific practice modalities, including Jewish mindfulness meditation, tikkun midot or character development practices, and tefillah, contemplative prayer, uh, as a way to uh, foster the skills that I just mentioned before. And uh, in addition to fostering the skills that Natalie spoke about before so beautifully and eloquently, it also fosters, our program also fosters greater joy, meaning and relevance in Jewish practice. We currently impact over 130 educators and thousands of children. Um, and the program is built on a combination of online learning, on-site teamwork, and one-on-one -on -one coaching with designated uh, team leads at each of the schools where we work. Happy to provide more details about the program if you're interested later on, but I wanted to give you a 30,000 foot view um, and talk a little bit about why we decided to develop this program and bring it out to the Jewish community back in 2016 when we uh, <clears throat> launched the program. Uh, and to do that, I actually want to tell you a story about a kid named Natalie. Natalie used to be in my meditation minyan when I was teaching at the Rochelle Zell Jewish High School here in Deerfield, Illinois, close to where I live. And uh, Natalie uh, came from a very high achieving family that had very high expectations of Natalie, both in terms of academic achievement and also in terms of uh, um, her aspirations to be become a concert pianist. And Natalie was a kid with an amazing heart, but she was always uh, worried about achieving and measuring up. And as a result, she was super high strung and incredibly anxious. And one morning she came into my weekly meditation minyan and plopped herself down uh, on the floor and said, oh my God, I'm so happy to be here. 
this is the only place in the world where no one expects me to achieve, where no one's sizing me up uh, based on a test score or whether I mastered you know, a particular sonata, right? This is the only place in the world where I can just be. You see, Natalie is not a special case. She's really just one of thousands of Jewish children who are experiencing unprecedented, level, unprecedented levels of isolation, anxiety, depression, and overwhelm. Before COVID hit, we were in the midst of an unprecedented mental health crisis among Jewish children. In the um, Maasai tradition in Africa, when people meet each other, they greet each other with the question, and how are the children? And if the answer is all the children are well, then everybody knows everything is okay, right? And unfortunately, we fund our program and we put resources and time and energy into it because we cannot answer the question, how are the children, with the response, all the children are well. And Jewish schools are looking for concrete ways to help the children by using Jewish wisdom and mindfulness while also bringing Jewish learning to life and making it more content relevant, not only intellectually, but at the heart level. And I can't tell you how many times I speak to heads of school who inquire about our program and they say, we're doing social and emotional learning through one of the programs, for example, that Natalie mentioned, like Ruler or Calm Classroom. And we do Jewish content, but we have no idea how to fuse these two. And one of the beautiful things about our program is that from inception, the mindfulness practices that we teach are grounded in a Jewish framework. Um, and as an antidote to growing rates of isolation, depression, anxiety, and hopelessness, we offer a healthy dose of social and emotional skills, including self-awareness, the ability to manage and navigate difficult emotions, developing relationship skills, empathy, and responsible decision-making skills, all skills that have been shown to promote well-being in educators and students. But on top of that, we also do something very, very special, which is that we teach educators and children to cultivate their spiritual lives as a foundation for lifelong thriving. And uh, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read Lisa Miller's book, The Spiritual Child. Lisa Miller is the um, chair of the psychology department at Columbia University and founder of their uh, Mind Body Education Institute. But she uh, has shown that the research indicates that teens who have developed a strong dose of spirituality defined as a sense of feeling connected to a higher power that is experienced as a loving, guiding presence and also transcendent relationships with others, especially with caring adults characterized by unconditional love, compassion, forgiveness, and empathy, experienced a 30 to 40% reduced risk for substance abuse and depression, two times greater than the benefits for adults. And we know of no other intervention that has that kind of an impact. And we don't have to wait till kids are in their adolescent years to plant the seeds for a healthy dose of spirituality and social and emotional skill. Research also shows that the children um, model their relationship with a higher power on the relationship with the caregivers in their lives. So if the caregivers, for example, are overly harsh or punitive, kids will come to believe in a God that is overly harsh and punitive. And on the other hand, if the caregivers are tremendously loving and compassionate and present, the kids will come to experience their relationship with the, the divine in that vein as well. And that's one of the reasons why we focus so intently on training mindful Jewish educators and why that work is so pivotal because as caregivers, they can model the kind of unconditional love, connection, kindness, and non-reactivity that will actually enable the students to develop a relationship with a loving divine presence, which again will serve them in terms of promoting their well-being. Um, before the pandemic, uh, we know that rates of isolation, depression, and anxiety were growing among children. Um, and now they're really skyrocketing through the roof. And kids and teachers need a healthy dose of spirituality to help them counter feelings of isolation, hopelessness, and fear with feelings of connection, optimism, and faith. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why thousands of new subscribers have been flocking to our programs in the last eight weeks. And we're hearing from heads of school all over the country that this work is pivotal and essential now more than ever. Um, and I wanna reassure you that much of our program was already running online through a 13 module course called The Gift of Awareness, Jewish Mindfulness Meditation for You and Your Students. And um, to this, we've also added free daily online meditations and weekly mini, mini retreats for our participants so that educators can feel supported to practice self-care during a time when they're so stretched. 
as well as weekly email supports with resources, downloadable audio meditations and practice scripts for the classroom, as well as tips for self-care. And beginning this week, actually, we're gonna be making our online course for educators available to Jewish educators nationwide at a reduced price of $49 down from $249. And we're seeking money from the Covenant Foundation as well to be able to offer rebates uh, upon completion of the course so that educators can actually go through that course for free over the summer and come back revitalized, restored with a self-care toolkit as well as some practices for the classroom for when they return. And moving beyond COVID-19, even when this pandemic is long past and school resu resumes in person, I have every reason to believe that the rates of isolation, anxiety, and depression will continue to rise, not to mention a host of new mental health challenges that will probably come out of the trauma of this time. In fact, over the next de decade, we're predicting greater suffering, uncert uncertainty, and instability, and kids need concrete tools to cultivate empathy, faith, and inner resilience. And I'll even go so far as to argue that a Jewish educational agenda that fails to, to provide kids with those tools will be deemed irrelevant at best. So I wanna urge you because now is the time to double down on introducing Jewish educators to Jewish spiritual practices that foster mindfulness, resilience, and spirituality in themselves and in their students. And thanks for being here today and thanks for offering us this platform. Thank you all so much. In a moment, we'll open up for questions. Actually, I just wanted, you reminded me of something, Sam, talking about um, Lisa Miller and her incredible work. We had her as a speaker at one of the PRISMA conferences. Uh, that actually came about um, thanks to someone introducing me to her work who had heard it at, uh, in Aspen, in fact, one summer when the Grinspoon Foundation had, in, had invited them. So Diane, thank you for you and Harold um, bring, bringing people like Lisa to all of us. We all very, very much appreciate it. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, just, just ask one or two quick questions and then open it up for others. Just listening to you, you know, I think one of the, the themes that, that has come through, and we've certainly seen it in our work as well, is how we've almost been in different phases um, as the crisis has developed. Debbie, I think you talked about triage and new normal. Um, I'm not sure what comes after new normal, if it's a new, new normal, what, whatever it is. I'm just interested in your from any of you, what is your perspective of what's coming next? And what, could you, what advice would you give to people directly involved in schools and people involved in trying to help fund Jewish education in the ways that they can contribute to whatever we might anticipate the next phase to look like or next phases to look like? And I will open that up. I don't have a particular order. Uh, Rachel, do you want to go first? Yeah, so I'll just start by saying, I think a lot of flexibility and nimbleness because there's so much uncertainty, um, there needs to be a lot of, for lack of a better word, scenario planning, right? Thinking about what it looks like in the fall, even though it's not so far from now, is in a way very far away because we really have no idea, you know, what's coming next. I think one of the one of the reasons that we are thinking about teacher professional development in, in a remote both, give, you know, to continue to plug remote skills is because we do imagine that to some degree there's going to be a flexibility that's needed to whether it's some of your children are with you and some are at home, whether it's because, you know, half the class is coming one day and half the class is coming another day. Um, it seems clear that that it's not going to just go back to what was before. Um, and so there needs to be a lot of planning for different types of situations. Yeah. I, I would agree with Rachel that, you know, and I spoke with the principal about this. Um, you know, we all transitioned very quickly at first, but we can't get, we can't afford to get um, caught flat footed in the fall if this happens again. We really have to be, our teachers really have to be prepared. And so, um, uh, so that is, that is one aspect that I see a few of us are working on. And, you know, I guess we'll try to collaborate after this call. And so that, um, there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of um, planning for teachers so that they feel uh, that they're more prepared for for the fall. Um, and you know, we actually also ran a a workshop for administrators on how do you assess the impact and the effectiveness of your remote learning program. So that's one level. I think another level is there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, will, will there be a hybrid model that might come out of this that might help, or what parts of this aspect? Um, you know, we, before this, we didn't, we, I guess, 
um, we didn't know that we could all shift remotely. And certainly there were some, um, some schools and some communities that didn't use Zoom until late, you know, some of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, schools that don't necessarily believe in, in that platform and so they were doing uh, some of our schools do conference calls but what we did see is that a remarkable number of schools and teachers did they did they did really um, uh, they did really pivot very quickly and they they learned on this platform so um, I guess the question is what what are the takeaways from this what can we take away from um, from uh, from what we saw, are there elements in our? Um, and I think as a field, we'll be thinking about this. Are there elements that we could do in Zoom uh, or remote learning pl um, platforms like a hybrid? You know, there's a flip model, but I don't know if we'll all shift to that. But the cost of day schools is so expensive, right? So are there aspects of this that can be done um, in a remote way or? You know the fact that fifth graders come home at 5:30. You know maybe they there are parts of which which you know we can argue is 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 insane, right? Um, so so perhaps there are some aspects of what of of what we do that can be done in a different format and and will impact uh, and will impact the uh, you know the the field. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. I want to just piggyback okay. on what you shared. Um, and say two things. One is that um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you know we're imagining that summer might provide a break for teachers, but in fact it may be more stressful um, because uh, with camp being canceled, uh, it's likely that many teachers are going to have to manage full-time parenting and won't even have the uh, ability to step away for a little bit to teach on Zoom, uh, which for some teachers, even though it was a big push, may have felt like a respite actually, in some ways, to be with other people's kids instead of their own. Um, and so, yes, for some, the summer will be restorative. For others, uh, coming back to school um, will probably uh, present a huge challenge um, because uh, they'll be so burned out from being at home. Um, and uh, I think this is a time to really focus on how schools can integrate um, <clears throat> tools for teachers' teacher self-care into professional development. Um, and make those broadly available in a format that the teachers can actually uh, take advantage of. Uh, the second thing is that, um, uh, you know, what we've been seeing in the funding world over the last number of years is that, you know, um, fewer and fewer people are willing to give unrestricted dollars. Um, and um, <clears throat> actually what I'm experiencing right now in talking with our current participants as well as pers prospective pers participants and people have spoken about this already is so much uncertainty. And actually, we don't exactly know what our program is going to look like in the fall. Um, and to be able to have flexibility from funders to, to say, here you go, we want to fund this program. And we understand that we're not 100% sure. And you can't be 100% sure. And the schools can't be 100% sure what it's going to look like, possibly even till day one, right? Um, when the realities are actually on the ground um, is extremely helpful. And I'll just say that I'm very grateful to our current funders who have been flexible in that way. It's just given us a tremendous um, relief to be able to have that kind of flexibility so that we can actually listen deeply to the schools and make adjustments accordingly. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Sharon Freundel and then Natalie, I'm going to come to you with another, with another question, but you can come back on this one as well. Sharon, quick. Um, I think the only, in answer to Paul's question, the only certain thing is that we have no idea what's going to happen. And for that reason, um, we at JIC are very much encouraging both the professionals in Jewish day school education and the funders to be looking not only at the next step, but off at the horizon, because the children are going to need consistency, whether they're in school, out of school, in school part of the time, and then going home, the more consistent we can make our approach to education, whether they're in the brick and mortar building or whether they're at home, the better the educational platform will be academic, social, emotional, and spiritual. And we need to keep our eye on the long-term goal of improving Jewish education, not only what is the next step am I going to take in response to the crisis. That is very true. That This is all part of a continuum towards that goal as opposed to uh, standing on its own. I, I'm going to ask one other question and, and then pick up some from the chat and uh, um, from discussion. Paul, can I just add one, one thing in terms of the let last... Let hold for a minute, Debbie, and then maybe when I come to you next, maybe bring it... Only because I want... I'll go to a couple of speakers just so we can try and get through two or three questions in the next 
uh, 10 minutes and keep it moving and let, let's keep answers uh, relatively brief. There was, a, there was something came up during the presentations around uh, the question of um, schools working in partnership with families. And is that an area that's ripe, as I think Rachel, you commented, for ex exploration as we move forward? I just wonder if we could comment, you could comment a little bit about the ways that we can engage uh, families more. Natalie, let me, let me start with you. Thank you so much. Um, I think, to me, one of the main contributors to a successful educational experience is a partnership between home and school. Um, I think that that's something that in many schools has taken a bit of a backseat for different reasons. It's schools are very busy, parents are busy. Um, but I think that was one of the things that I was very adamant about in our program is that there must be communication to parents. Um, they need to know what we're talking about in class. They need to know what skills we're focusing on. They need to know where our mindset is at so we can all get on the same page and be guiding the children together. Um, I think that as we move through this, I, I'm very blessed. Our school has been very on top of things. There has been a lot of communication coming to parents and teachers have been calling my kids offline after Zoom just to talk to them, just to ad, admins have been calling parents. Um, I think that's a model that goes a really long way in creating a sense of trust and togetherness and a partnership between the schools and the families. Um, that is something I would definitely not want to lose. That's something I'm, I'm always encouraging. Um, and just to touch back on what you were saying before, what are certain things that we need to go forward with? Um, I would say that talking a lot to what Sam had said also, you know, there's social emotional support and learning in classrooms is tremendous for children and it is almost equally important for teachers. And there's a lot of statistics that show that in classrooms that engage in social emotional learning, the teacher burnout is much less and teachers feel inspired and motivated to continue with their work and they can do it from a heart centered place because their heart is also being tended to. Um, and I think that, as was mentioned by Debbie, and I think all of us know, the teachers have been doing a tremendous amount of lifting. And to me, something, even if you don't go in and, and support the school in necessarily a social emotional learning program, many schools have different like funds to support teachers to make sure that there's like a gratitude, uh, a show of gratitude for like a Rosh Chodesh breakfast or end of the year gifts. And I think that all those little things, anytime that people in the school who are dedicating their life and their time to really raising your children with you anytime that we can partner with them and say we have your back we're gonna show our gratitude we're going to help you do your job um i think is tremendous i think it takes a weight off of the schools i think it makes our administrative administration feel supported and appreciated and i think that if we show that to our kids just on a personal level that wherever you're involved, wherever you are, you are a part of it or wherever you are, you're gonna leave, you wanna make it better than before you arrived, then that's another lesson that they're learning through your engagement and involvement. Thank you. Debbie, did you wanna jump in? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, I would agree what, um, with, um, with what you were saying, Natalie. And um, we're, we're actually just, um, I think the, the idea of um, ensuring that parents are going to be successful, um, going back to what you said, Sam, it's such, they're, such a, they're such critical players. One of the, we're working actually on a, uh, on a summer institute for parents. And to be honest, one of the questions that we were asking ourselves is, well, if camps aren't necessarily happening, so will parents have the bandwidth for this? Um, and so we were, you know, we're weighing, well, what are the kinds of things that sort of are critical and, and, uh, um, and would, you know, some sort of balance in between so that we do offer support for parents that, uh, so that going into the new school year, they will feel uh, confident to, uh, or or more, more ready um, to, um, to be their best selves. Thank you. Thank you, those are tough challenges. Anyone who's not following the, uh, the chat, I just uh, take a look at, look at it. There's a good discussion going. One or two other questions getting answered. Uh, let me open up for, I think we probably have one or two other questions or comments from the group, from anyone. 
Javi, did you want to, Javi Khan, did you want to join in? Yes, hi, it's Javi Khan from UJ. I, I completely appreciate this, uh, this conversation really resonates, but I also want to highlight another aspect, which is the financial pressures that are facing both current financial aid families as well as situationally impacted families. So just to layer on top of this, there are families now that, I mean, we all know this, but because of the unemployment and the financial pressure are dealing with a whole range of questions such as, am I applying for financial aid? How do I do that? Will I get it? Not let alone the pressures facing schools, which is significant. I really want to, I want to echo and underscore that school leadership, the school leadership in New York that I'm speaking to, um, it's very difficult. They are planning for situations that they don't have numbers for, their boards are pressuring them, they don't know the, you know, they're trying to do the best that they can, but this is really unchartered territory, which colors decisions that then impact educators and families. So whatever we can do as a system, to support the school leaders, support the board presidents, support the families. It's in my view, mission critical. Javi, I just wanna to speak to that point for a moment. Um, I agree 100%. I just got off of the, the phone last Friday with two heads of school um, in uh, the Northern New Jersey area who said, you know, we're in survival mode right now. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, that being said, I think that um, you know, people are really focusing on on how do we you know keep school open and um, how do we keep you know people on payroll, um, and um, <clears throat> I think that that is uh, you know obviously um, you know priority number one. Um, I think one of the the pieces that that we um, we can help with is uh, to help um, schools understand. Uh, that um, this kind of work that we're talking about actually is essential to survival um, because parents especially are going to be looking um, to double down and invest in schools that can provide this kind of social and emotional and spiritual support to their students. And um, it's going to, I think, make a big deal in terms of recruitment uh, for next fall. Um, so I just want to you know, explicitly put that out there because I think sometimes think, oh yeah, you know, when we're in survival mode, you know, attending to the social and emotional and spiritual piece takes back seat. And actually, this is, I think, one of the things that's going to distinguish the schools that's, that survive from those that do not, among, of course, many, many other factors. But this will be, I think, a central pillar as well. And thank you. And, and thank you, Javi, as well. I um, want to be very respectful um, of everyone's time and um, just draw draw us together firstly with with hope i mean we we know and appreciate and i'm glad that it, that you brought it up the question of the pressures especially financial on school which are so critical um the beauty of course of being able to have this particular conversation in that context is to see so many of the things that are strengths within school and bring greater capacity and greater uh, ability for them to be resilient you know the, the uh, as, as many people have sort of been quoting through the crisis you're only as good as you were the day before and um i was in a, a conversation actually with uh, a, a jfn call um with funders in canada last week or the week before i think it was and we were trying to someone was trying to sort of unpick what was it about our schools that enabled them to do what they have done so strongly and I think it is the combination of the leadership that they have. It is the way that they approach education in this holistic sense. It is the fact that each of our schools is a community and has relationships across the community through not just students, but parents and staff together. All of those things add up to the resilience, the grit that I think will help them be best placed to uh, to, to get through it. In addition to that, it is the way that, as we've heard from these wonderful four speakers today, we're able to think about the different aspects of education, of social and emotional needs, and of spiritual needs that our students have. So I want, really want to thank Rachel, Natalie, Debbie, and Sam 
so much for your time and your energy and especially for the work that you do every day. I want to thank everyone for being with us in this conversation and to close to hand back to Tamar and thank you to JFN, Tamar. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I want to echo all of, all of the thank yous to, to our partners at Prisma, Paul and Khanna, and to all of the presenters, Rachel, Natalie, Debbie, and, and Sam, and also to all of you that participated. This is such an, important, such an important time for us to come together and learn and share and, and figure out how we can, we can work together and collaborate to, to stay as strong as possible and to hopefully come out stronger. And with that, I want to let you know that we will be doing something hopefully in another few weeks in June. Look out in your email for that. I'll also email you later this week with a recording of this, of this program and links to the different pr programs and the different people that spoke today. And I'm always available here at Tamar at, JF, at, at jfunders.org to answer any questions or to help you connect with each other offline. So thank you again and stay well and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you to all of you. Thank you. Take good thank care. You. Thank you.